The, the most concerning thing about our world is not that there are a lot of bad people doing bad things. It's a, a lot of good people doing bad things up under the, the sway of unfounded and, and dangerous and divisive beliefs. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got the iconic and legendary Sam Harris in the house. Good to see you, sir. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for being yeah. here. Uh, I've heard about you for many years, all incredible things, and I'm excited to dive into your whole life. Yeah, all Let's right. start from I'm childhood. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've been, uh, you've been really known for meditation over the last few years, more and more, from what I've heard from you. It's more about meditation. You've got this incredible app the waking up app, mm. and your voice is so soothing that it's very relaxing yeah, as well. Yeah, or soporific, depending on... <laughs> exactly. You know, when did you get into meditation, and why did you feel like it was necessary for your life? Uh, I was 18, and um, I had a drug experience with MDMA, and this is mm -hmm. before MDMA was Get the... cool. Uh, right? yeah, yeah, I mean, a little, I, had, I knew no one in my generation who had tried it or had even heard of it. I mean, I'm sure... Someone had, but um, it was, uh, this was 86, I think, um, 85, 86. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, raves, as far as I know, hadn't been invented. And, mm -hmm. it's, you know, and, and this, was, this was kind of an export from the psychotherapeutic community that had been using it for quite some time. And so it was given to me explicitly as a, as a tool to explore the, the nature of consciousness and to realize something fundamental about about the, the, especially kind of relationships and you know my own emotional life mm -hmm. and I really didn't know what to expect again because I, I, I'd only known one person who had taken it and um, so I sat down with my best friend and we we tried this drug and it was it was it really amounted to a a total firmware upgrade of my brain. I mean, mm. it was just, you know, it's not, and again, I, I don't want to sound like a booster for psychedelics entirely. I mean, there's, there are downsides to all these drugs. Uh, you, know, you, you know, I think, I think MDA, MDMA in particular stands a chance of being somewhat neurotoxic. You know, mm. the, the, the data <clears throat> at least is ambiguous on that. Um, people can have bad experiences, certainly on LSD and psilocybin, and I've had those experiences. And so I, it, it's a mixed message. And I have a, a, a chapter in my book, Waking Up, uh, titled D D "Drugs and the Meaning of Life," and there's actually an audio version of that on on my podcast. It's, it might even be the first podcast. So if people want the the full story there, they can get it. But um, the the reality for me was that this, and, and this is true for many people, MDMA showed me a landscape of mind and, and a way of being that I didn't realize was possible. You know, I was an 18 year old who was. You know, very egocentric, and you know, my ego was well defended, and and you know, I had no, you know, the notion of experiencing unconditional love had not oh. occurred to me, and you know, and there's just many things that I just was not, you know, if you had asked me, you know, what was someone like religion, someone like Jesus talking about, and what were the what what what's the core of all of the religions that people take so seriously, the experiential core of it, uh, I would. I think I had just an empty file on that. I just had no sense of, you know, what people had been doing for the last two thousand years wow. to, to transform the, their experience. So, um, so I had this experience of yeah, of you know, unconditional love is not too strong a word. And so during this uh, experience, you felt unconditional love. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, what what I felt was uh, kind of. Layers of self-concern there that I, I didn't even know existed get stripped away, and what was left was a, a state of being that was just wide open and and has had a, as its ethical core just unlimited good intention toward wow. other people, whether they're friends or strangers. And I realized that I loved strangers in the same way that I loved friends and family at, at the at the most basic level because I just wanted everyone to be happy. And 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 the that desire was so was so it was just turned up to eleven, right? So mm -hmm. it was just like so you realize that's if if your if the real ballast for you emotionally and ethically is that you want 
other people to be happy. You want them to have beautiful lives. You want them to be to to realize their their dreams. You want their. Uh, I mean, you, you basically you you realize that there's the, there's the sense that there's a zero sum contest between your well being or your happiness mm-hmm. and, and uh, others is an illusion, right? I mean, you want all boats to rise with with right. some tide. Win win experience with yeah. everyone, yeah. Um, so you want po- positive some interactions with people. Uh, that was, I mean, that just it just bowled over every other you know, wrinkle in my uh, in my mind for, for the period of you know four hours, right? So there was wow. just there was no uh, there was no limit to that, and it's not transactional. You you realize that that is actually a state of being. That's that's the way you're. That, that could be the default state of your own consciousness, if you could only locate it, you know, and then. Coming down from an experience like that, you know, the drug wears off, and then you're, mm-hmm. you're returned to who you used to be, uh, <laughs> with the memory of what it was like a few hours before. And so that then uh, there was an imperative to figure out what just what was possible in terms of uh, you know techniques like meditation mm-hmm. or you know, ch- you know new understandings of how the mind works. I mean, what what there, there's clearly a path. There must be a path by which. One can have that experience more and more of the time, sure. and so then my notion of just what what the goal of meditation was. I mean, that that has actually changed a bit. It's not about producing this state of unconditional love all the time. I mean, I, I think that's that's not actually the center of the bullseye. But that was the first experience I had, which which gave me a sense that there, there's a path and there's some something to do. Did you, know? you ever feel like you had a sense of unconditional love before that moment? Oh no, no. I mean, I had no reference point. Or no reference. I mean, I had love for you know. I love my mom, right? Like you know, I, you know. There's no I, love was a noun that I, I could use uh, you know, honestly, but no, there was no. Uh, I mean, there hadn't been a glimmer of that experience really. Wow. I mean, it was actually the first moment in my life that I felt sane, and I hadn't realized At eighteen. That, yeah, no, I mean, well, and it was only by comparison to all previous states. I mean, like I had this experience. And I realized, okay, okay, this is, this is sanity, right? Like, the, you know, the, this is how it should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and this, and the return to one's normal waking, you know, narcissistic, uh, neurotic <laughs> consciousness, was one of not not being restored to because because everyone's concern here is that I mean, so a dr- drugs, you know, one problem is that we have this word drug uh-huh. that that is the the word we use to, to cover this vast class of compounds that are psychoactive. And some drugs are awful and not worth taking and just intrinsically bad for you, both in terms of what they do to you neurophysiologically and, right. and the kinds of states of consciousness that people, you know, in, in experience there. Um, and other drugs, you know, I would argue uh, have immense therapeutic value and, mm-hmm. and are worth taking under, under the right conditions. Um, and MDMA is certainly one of those drugs, and it's being used for, as a as a remedy for PTSD now mm-hmm. in a lot of research uh, to yeah. great effect. Um, but people think, oh, you've taken a drug, so this, by definition, this is uh, artificial. This is a this. So whatever you experience there is is less like the real you mm. than whatever re- returns when the drug wears off, right? Um, but that wasn't the experience, and that's certainly not the experience as you get deeper into things like meditation that don't in- entail drugs, right? That, like, you can actually discover that the way you're tending to be, the way you're, you've been conditioned to be by life and, and you know, biology, frankly. I mean, we're not, you know, evolution has not designed us to, to maximize our well-being. Evolution has designed us to, to be fairly paranoid. Mm-hmm. Uh, to try to stay and, safe, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not, ourselves. We're, we're apes, right? <clears throat> right. You know, it's just, it, it, this is not about our happiness. From the, the, the gene's eye view of what we're doing here is not, you know, maximizing human happiness and building a global civilization that will endure for a million years, right? That's just not what our genes care about, you know? They care about being safe or? Well, they care about, I mean, all we've evolved to do is maximize the likelihood that we will successfully spawn and stay around long enough to see that our progeny survive and spawn, right? So it's like you're, you know, once you're 40 years old, evolution doesn't care about you, you know, for the most part. I mean, I guess there's some argument that grandparents are a value or even great grandparents are a value but it's just it can't see uh so much of what 
we need to be happy, right? You know, it's like we, we're, we're deeply conditioned for tribal violence, right? And tribal violence is just is something that we obviously have to outgrow, globally speaking. Um, uh, we're deeply conditioned to perceive ourselves in at least potentially hostile relationships with all other you know, apes like ourselves. And, uh, and yet the self, the, the feeling of self, and this is, this is actually getting closer to what I think the, the, the goal of meditation is, uh, the sense of self is an illusion. Right. This is a this is a construct that can be felt through and, and discovered to actually be false, uh, and there's a, there's an immense amount of good that comes with that discovery, but it's not something that that uh, has paid uh, adaptive dividends in the past, and it's it's something that you know it might actually be um, hostile to what uh, uh, would keep an a an ape you know, safe, you know, for, for, the, for the millions of years our, we and our ancestors have evolved, right? So there are many things, there are many good things, and I would argue most good things that we want to be able to pay attention to in the year 2019, um, and that we want to have the free attention to, to the free attention to, to explore, um, are, would be counterproductive if, you know, you were returned to the savannah mm-hmm. and just just in a contest of all against all. You know? right. So, I mean, everything from, I mean, you know, uh, you know conversations like this. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to talk about almost nothing that, a, that apes like ourselves have needed to focus on Cared for, for 500,000 years. When did we start to focus on the desire to be happy? When, like, what year or years or decades was this where we really said, okay, we've got our needs met or basic mm-hmm. needs met. Let's focus on being happy and feeling unconditional love more. Yeah, well, well, it depends who you're talking about, because most of uh, most of humanity, even at this moment, doesn't have the free attention to really think seriously about what it means to be happy. You know, it's just I mean, when you just look at the economic imperatives of you know most people in most situations, it's not about. Uh, really having the, the free attention to do whatever you want or what you what you, what you would think at the end of the day uh, would be most satisfying. It's right? about so, survival, more yeah, basic needs. And... Yeah, yeah, and and or just you're living in a situation of stark political insecurity, right? right. You're just worried about you know what sort of violence may happen in the street later today, or like what you what you may or may not say mm-hmm. that could get you jailed, right? It's you know, crazy. So, it's, it's not so like so so much of human history has been just rig- figuring out how to get strangers to cooperate reliably enough so that they have the free attention to explore the things we want to explore so that yeah we can figure out why you know why we're dying from diseases and then you know cancel them right so right. like like just just to just to be able to do science is a luxury right sure. and um and this is where, I mean, you know, as you probably know, I've spent a lot of time criticizing organized religion uh, because, you know, historically and even currently, so much of it is hostile to, I mean, so, so much of it is putting in place of, of, of real curiosity and a real search for answers, Iron Age fictions that just got, you know, codified in books mm-hmm. that can't be edited, right? So in my view, the, the main tool we have to navigate now, and this has always been the case, but it's it's just more and more imperative that we realize this, the main tool is human conversation. And what every religion is, is a, an insistence by a certain group of people uh, that we anchor ourselves to a conversation that, that was held hundreds or thousands of years ago. Right. So, and, right. And so it's like you, either you want to have the best ideas actionable and 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 uh, interpretable now or you want to be hostage to what your great 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 grandfather and grandmother thought was true about the nature of reality and if you go back far enough you're talking to people who knew absolutely nothing that a sixth grader knows today right you know i mean literally if you could get, get a build a time machine and send a sixth grader back a thousand years that boy or girl would be the, the smartest and wisest person on earth in the world. On, on, on so many topics, right? I mean, just 
just to know that electricity exists, right? You're a, you're a savant, right? So, um, or the DNA has something to do with biological inheritance, or, right. or, or the, the germ theory of disease. I mean, imagine being the, the the lone person on Earth who understood that you know you should you should wash your hands before uh, you deliver babies. You save the world. Yeah, exactly. Save humanity from that. Yeah. So it's insane that we are captive to doctrines mm. that uh, just we're never in contact with with the, with the knowledge base that we we have currently. Why, why do so many people believe so strongly in their religion? And I'm not here to say someone's right or wrong, but why do they believe I so strongly? That's why okay, I can't. Okay, you can yeah, do what okay. you want to say. Yeah. Why do so many people, I mean, there's billions of people that still believe in religion, that yeah. have a religion, and that believe so firmly in the beliefs of the books from their religion, and yet, they can't prove any of those things from those books. Is that right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. They can't prove. Well, they, they certainly can't prove those things. Certain yes. things actually yeah. happened in certain books. Right. Except yeah. for just that someone wrote a story about I mean, it. Yeah. I mean, some imagine that they have proof, but I mean, it's, it's often. There's that, no that, actual that, physical proof today that these things. Happen. No, and I mean, it's worse still. The, the the books themselves say that they're inerrant, right? I mean, the Quran says that it's inerrant, and the Bible says that it's inerrant, in various places. And that is taken as evidence of its inerrancy. Well, I mean, the Lord of the Rings could, I mean, Tolkien could have put a line in there which said this is, you know, perfectly true and, you know, any doubt otherwise would get you, you know, consigned to yeah. hell. And that wouldn't prove that the, the book is true. So it's, it's just, you know, it doesn't... Um, so, so and, and, and the amazing thing is that, you know, every Christian looks at the Quran and looks at the, the whole discourse around it within Islam and finds it completely unpersuasive. You know, and every Muslim returns the favor with respect to Christianity. So it's it's not, um, if you stand outside of one of these traditions, you can see that the language game that they're playing within it to justify everything is is illegitimate. But in, in defense of religious people, it's true that there are these core needs in life, emotionally uh, and socially, that secular culture has been very slow to meet. And in certain cases, has almost nothing to say, right? right? So, I mean, with, especially with respect to the kinds of experiences, you know, we started this conversation on. I mean, it's just you know, like the experience of self-transcendence or yeah. the experience of unconditional love. If you have that experience, if you wake up tomorrow morning feeling unconditional love for all sentient beings, right? You, you, traditionally, there has been no language with which to greet that epiphany, mm. but religious language. I mean, right. so you, if you go into a church and say, listen, I've just had this experience, they have a lot to tell you about you know, Jesus and, and sure. his grace and, and, you know, and um, uh, the power of prayer. And uh, uh, it links up with 2,000 years of seeking experiences of that uh, kind in a contemplative context, you know, monks and nuns. Uh, and I mean, if you go too far, then they begin to worry that you're, you know, you're you're too heterodox. And you know, in, in the 14th century, if you went too far, you know, they would burn you at the stake because you're right, you're right. claiming to be God yourself, or you're claiming to be the equivalent of Jesus, right? So mm -hmm. that, there's a there's a hierarchy there that you have to respect. And the same is true for Islam. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, so there is a baby in the bathwater that that religious people are right to worry is being disregarded or being thrown out. Uh, when you criticize faith yeah. and, and criticize yeah. these doctrines. Um, and then the, the other reason that religion endures, and it's really the main one, is that, you know, we all die, and the people we love die, mm -hmm. and that uh, is intolerable. And it is, it's true that if you can believe a sufficiently consoling story about what death means or what it doesn't mean, um, a lot of the stress of life goes away. Yeah, gives you, you know? more peace. Yeah, I mean, it, to, in certain cases, total peace. I mean, right. that, like in certain cases, it's if you believe the sufficient doctrines, it's a good thing. I mean, you can literally get yourself into into a situation, as it often happens under Islam, where you know a, a, a mother can legitimately celebrate the you know, the suicide bombing perpetrated by her jihadist because son. She knows she'll because see it. Yeah. she knows he he got into paradise wow. as a martyr, and he got the whole family in there too. Right? This is like you know it's the, the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, and it's 
it's all good. I mean, if you really believe it, it's all good. Nothing has gone wrong there. Right. And, and so that's the power of belief, and that's what, you know, it's the insidious power of belief because it's the thing that, I mean, something like suicide bombing should be impossible. It should be impossible to convince somebody to do that, right? Uh, it's, I mean, it should, be, it should be synonymous with, you know, severe depression and just, you know, an inability to find any goodness in life. That's not the kind of person who becomes a jihadist and, and becomes a suicide bomber. These are not the, you know, depressed people who would otherwise be, you know, medicated in a mental hospital uh, uh, because their depression is so severe. No, this is, these are people who have a lot to live for, for the most part. You know, they're mm -hmm. disproportionately well-educated. These are people who are, you know, come out of engineering programs and colleges. They can get jobs. They, there's, there's economic opportunity. You know, they have... They're, they have sincere beliefs in this case martyrdom and, and the reality of paradise. Um, so, yeah. So I've spent a lot of time, uh, you know, worrying out loud about the consequences of those kinds of ideas because, mm -hmm. for me, the, the most concerning thing about our world is not that there are a lot of bad people doing bad things. It's a, a lot of good people doing bad things up under the, the sway of unfounded and, and dangerous and divisive beliefs. Right. I mean, ideas are right. way more powerful than you know, the 1% the, the of us or the half of 1% of us who just happen to be psychopaths. Right, you know? right. Because yeah. if you put a belief in, it's like inception. It's like you planted a, an idea so deeply in someone's mind that this is going to happen. They believe it so much that they're willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to make it a reality. Yeah. I'm curious, what do you believe happens when we die? I don't know. I just, I, I don't know, I mean, that would require that we understand exactly how consciousness arises, and, and we don't understand that yet. Um, I mean, there's, there's certainly good reason to doubt that you, as you experience yourself most of the time, as a, you know, the, the, the English-speaking uh, you know, uh, uh, person who, or subject, who uh, has the episodic memories you have of your mm -hmm. life, um, uh, that that entity uh, <clears throat> floats off the brain and goes elsewhere, right? And that's, that's the expectation that most people have who believe in souls, right? And, and when, you, when you hear people use uh, so-called near-death experiences to justify a belief in an afterlife, that's, it's, it's that kind of mm -hmm. uh, arithmetic that's being done. They said, well, I was, you know, I, I, I saw myself in a tunnel of light or I saw, I, you know, I rose up off the table that they were performing surgery on me. I could see myself, uh, but then I realized I was, you know, not connected to my body. And then I, you know, and then there's some story about how they you know, met entities or met, even met members of their own family who had died, you know, and, mm. and they're, you know, so if you can recognize your grandma, and still understand English, and then still have a memory of, of, of the life you're leaving. All, all of those are modes of cognition uh, that we know a fair amount about at the level of the brain now, and we know they can be disrupted uh, piecemeal in life, right? You know that, we know that if you get a stroke, or if you, just, if you go into a lab and they do TMS on you, transcranial mag magnetic stimulation, they can interrupt certain functions which you know really are, are no longer there anymore, just because with the, you know the, that neural real estate mm -hmm. has been perturbed, and so yet, so the proposition here is that you know if you interrupt one part of neuro, neuronal function, you lose let's say your capacity to understand English, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you destroy the brain at death, everything about yourself that's familiar will can, persist, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so mind, we know a lot about mind being dependent on the brain. You know, all the any function you could point to in yourself. You know, what, mind, vision, mind versus brain. What's but, the difference? Well, I mean, the mind on some basic level is what the brain is doing, and if the brain stops doing that, it's it's reasonable to expect that the functions of mind will stop. But consciousness is the fact that it's like something to be associated with that with that information processing. Mm -hmm. And that is still fundamentally mysterious. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that our brain is doing that seems unconscious, right? It's, and seems unavailable to consciousness in principle. And so, like, and, and so, and it's, these unconscious process, processes are delivering 
the contents of consciousness in each moment, right? So you and I are having a conversation. I can see you. I can hear you. Right. I can, you know, there, there are things that are stable um, that I can inspect because they're they're among the contents of consciousness. But how all of this stuff is showing up is un- is is being unconsciously mediated and really can't be inspected. So right. you know, like I'm. I mean, the, the example I always use is, you know, because I, I'm always talking when I have to use an example, but so like, to some degree, you know, however imperfectly, I am managing to follow the rules of English grammar without knowing how I do that, sure. right? And you're, you're able to effortlessly Listen, interpret. Listen understand, yeah. Yeah, so, and in fact, you, you don't even have a choice. If I say the word pigeon, right, you can understand it, I mean, provided you're a, a native English speaker and that's right. in your vocabulary. You can't help but understand it. You can't, it's like you can't say, well, whatever that next word is going to be, I'm just going to block the semantics of it. No, the semantics <laughs> right. just come in, right? Because, and so you're, you're doing all of this, your brain is doing all of this unconsciously. And you can't, you can't get to a place where you are standing upstream of the, the, the parsing of, of, the, of the, the sounds I'm making. I'm just making a bunch of small mouth noises, right? <laughs> right. And... I mean, and you know the difference when you're in the presence of someone who's speaking a language mm-hmm. of which you know not a single word, right? You know, wh- whatever that is, Thai, say. Um, it just sounds like pure gibberish. And, the, and, and, and the, the surprising thing there is that you, it's very hard to even imagine that anyone can decode those sounds and extract meaning at all, right? It just sounds like, well, it's amazing that that's a language, right? right. Uh, and yet, once you know the language, you can't help but decode it. So all of that's mm. unconscious. Um, and uh, and yet, the fundamental mystery of our being, and the most important thing in the universe, really. I mean, the, I would argue the only important thing in the universe is the fact that the lights are on, as in and as what we are here subjectively, which which is consciousness. You know, if the lights were off, right? If it was all just, if if there was no distinction between biological systems and this table. Right, you know, if there was nothing that it was like to be you, um, and there could never become something that it was like to be you or any other physical system, well, then there is no, there's no important distinction between the wet stuff we have in our heads and rocks and you know, right. you know, the, the water and the ocean. I mean, it's just, it's all just stuff that has can can have no interests. It can't it can't suffer. It can't experience happiness. It can't be deprived of happiness. It can't be creative. It can't so. The, the good thing about this universe is consciousness. And so, and that's, and, and the thing we can care about, uh, you know, your, your, your life is as your, your consciousness is in each moment. And I mean, you, you, all you have is your experience and your possible experiences. And, um, you know, the, uh, and that's the core of our morality too. It's like, like it, it, we we are we are, we are in a position with one another where we can affect each other's states of well-being and our opportunities to, to experience further well-being in, in the future, and and that matters. And and our conversation around that is our conversation around morality and ethics and mm-hmm. and you know politics and yeah. you know so how do we how do we unlock our consciousness? Or expand it in a positive way. Well, Bes- it's a, besides yeah. meditation, obviously, but what are some? How can we think differently so we can unlock this consciousness for ourselves? Yeah, well, there are many levels at which to do that. I mean, so there's there is so meditation is there are many different kinds of meditation, but the, the kind that interests me most and, and which I most recommend is um, it often got, goes by the name of mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, mindfulness mm-hmm. is very widespread, but there's there's a sort of trivial versions of mindfulness, and there's the, the deeper version. And, and the deeper version is really to understand the mechanics of your own mental suffering sure. and put yourself in a position to, to cease to suffer unnecessarily. Right. So you you notice that that you're lost in thought almost every moment of your life, and much of your thinking has this this mediocre character of of causing you to worry about the the future and and regret the past mm-hmm. and and just feel a a, a baseline disease 
with life, right? Whether whether it is just you know what it was like for me to drive here in traffic and like, like am I going to be late? You know, I'm supposed right. to be here at ten o'clock and like so all like like so much of our life is the steady hum of that kind of uh, thinking, right? And uh, not to mention the you know the bigger concerns about you know disease and you know whether your child is sick and like we're thinking like we we're plunged into thought in each moment and we don't notice it mm. and until you learn to be mindful you can't notice it all you got I me mean, you, you might have this abstract idea that yeah of course i'm thinking a lot of the time but you know so what or like what well, how you know what's the alternative right there is no alternative you're just each thought will arise and completely capture your attention and then you are hostage to the the emotional and behavioral imperatives of that thought, right? So, uh, and, so and, and it's necessary to, to, to some degree to be that way because we need, we need thought. I mean, we, we, thought is the way we, we organize our lives and, and form plans and, and, and understand what's happening, right? So like it's a, yeah. almost <clears throat> everything that makes us human is born of our capacity for abstract thought and, to, and planning and goal formation and all the rest but it's possible to recognize thought as uh, a stream of appearances in consciousness and to recognize that consciousness is a the kind of the prior condition of their arising and when you can do that you can actually break the link between thought and psychological suffering so like so if you if so the thought is a an, ang- an anxiety producing thought right you can notice this whole process where a thought arises and you feel anxious and that feeling of anxiety in your body uh, uh, when once uninspected begins to generate the, the motive for further thoughts along those lines. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking about the thing that makes you anxious and because you're anxious you, you're finding the anxiety intolerable. You've got resistance to feeling this, this feeling and you're thinking about like, how can I get out of this? And like, oh, okay, clearly I got, I've got a lot, I've got to change here. Let me get a, you know, I'm going to start writing some things down on a checklist, you know, and you're, you're, you're thinking without knowing that you're thinking and you're feeling the motive force of this, this emotion. But if you, once you can become mindful, which is, is, is which is to just be aware of what's arising in, in consciousness without judgment, without reaction, without resistance, right? I mean, so, so to be able to notice anxiety as a, just a pattern of sensation in the body, right? And then when you can do that, you can see that, for, first of all, it's not that bad, right? right, right. In fact, you, you're not you, dying. You, yeah, no, and, and under, under a different framing, it's a sensation that is, that is often pleasant, right? Like the, 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 the excitement you feel or even the anxiety you feel before you get on a roller coaster, right? If that's your thing, is something you're you're willing to pay to do, <laughs> right? Like, about, you, yeah. yeah, you want this thing. <laughs> you want that's part of the experience. Go skydiving. Yeah, whatever. Like, like, like that's yeah. that's the you know the the being able to. Ha- I mean, the thrill is a thrill because you have you felt some of that, right? Yeah. So, um, and that, and that's why I say there are other levels at which you can you can work with the contents of consciousness so as to cease to be unhappy. I mean, and, and one is to change the frame around an experience like that. So mm-hmm. I mean, to recognize that anxiety, uh, you know, the anxiety you might feel before going out on stage in front of a thousand people, just the raw sensation in your torso and in your face, I mean, just, just the physiology of Tenseness, it. Tenseness. Yeah, yeah. That is importantly similar to something that can have a positive frame which you seek out, like excitement. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I mean, a much more extreme case of this is like you, you can when you think of what the physical sensations are when you're working out, you know, and, and you know, working out as hard as you can work out and mm-hmm. in the most satisfying way, the, the precisely the workout you'll feel good for having done. The actual sensations are, can be extremely unpleasant. Exactly. And, it, and if they just came upon you in a different context. You would call nine one one. You'd be absolutely terrified, right? Like it just, I'm sweating yeah. profusely. Yeah. My muscles are ripping. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's just um, so f- the frame, the the, the the conceptual frame around experience mm-hmm. does a tremendous amount. Uh, but mindfulness is a more basic ability to notice this mechanism of becoming identified with thought and and resisting certain emotions and mood states, 
and being able to just unlock from mm. all of that and recognize that consciousness itself, that, that which is simply aware of experience, is not actually changed by, by its contents. I mean, so like the, that which is aware of joy is the same thing as that which is aware of sadness, right? And on some level, it, it's not diminished by sadness or improved by joy. And you keep dropping back into that state and paradoxically and, and happily, that state begins to have its own kind of qualitative character, which is, which is more toward the good side of things. I mean, it's more joyful and compassionate and loving and positive. And it, because, because the antithesis of all those states is what is happening, is being, is being kindled by our entanglement with thought and mm -hmm. reactivity. It's like, it's like the, it's the resistance to, you know, I feel the sensations of anxiety, say, because I was lost in thought about how, you know, you know afraid of failure I am I mean, a moment ago. Uh, I c can break that spell with mindfulness and then notice that the, the physiology, which still t may take a few seconds to dissipate, yeah. It's fine, right? Like it's just it's fine to feel that way. It's like it has no more meaning in that moment than a pain in the knee or indigestion or something which is which you which you completely can contextualize and it and has no implication for who you are as a person, wow. right? Like I don't, you know, you don't feel a pain in the knee and abstract from that those you know unpleasant sensations back upon yourself and think. I'm such a fucking schmuck, right? Like, like, like well, right. who am I? Like, my, uh, how did I become this person? I, like, like, it doesn't, but people with anxiety, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you've got stage fright, right, you're going out on stage and you feel nerves, the, 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 le the potential for self-judgment, the potential to read into that mere peripheral display of sensation that you're this person who is, who's, you know, all, you know didn't, didn't work out, right, you know, in the end, um, you know, people fall into that hole again and again, right? And it's com it's completely it's not it's not just sort of unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And you know, mindfulness is a tool that would allow you to yeah. discover that. Yeah. You know? If you could uh, wave a magic wand or set the parameters for how you wanted to think each day, the thoughts that you actually came in your mind, and you could control it. I'm assuming you control them in a lot of your own ways with your mm -hmm. own strategies and techniques and awareness. But if you could just say, I'm sick of trying to control it or reframing things when they come up, and you could just say, I want to think these thoughts every day. What would mm -hmm. you want to think? What type of thoughts would you want to think? And what would you want to eliminate? Yeah, well, so first, more fundamentally, I'd, I'd want to recognize that uh, the mind just the mind has no shame it just thinks it, thinks. it, it just thinks yeah. right so like the thoughts just keep coming and the you know the goal from a meditative point of view and this is a this is an analogy that's used in tibetan buddhism is to get into into a position where thoughts are like thieves entering an empty house right so there's just mm. there's just no possible problem can't right? steal anything yeah there's just nothing to steal that's right? interesting so that so to to truly be indifferent to a good th between a good thought and a wow. bad thought that's that's the real superpower that right? is cool so so that's so that's that's the kind of the more fundamental level of, of addressing the problem but it's also true that you can skillfully kind of curate the contents of your your thinking and think better thoughts deliberately and you can think more creative thoughts you can think more compassionate thoughts ethical thoughts um, and yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm interested in in many many things. I want to know know more about many many things. I want yeah. to be, uh, you know, right more often than I'm wrong. I mean, so the, and all of that's happening at the level of of the 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 conversation you're having with yourself and other people, and we and with good books, and and so, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there are philosophies like you know. You know the Western philosophy of Stoicism. You know, like the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, there, there, there's so many good thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, that if you if you were looking for a script that would generate a um, a reliable baseline of, of psychological well-being and, and ethical conduct, you know, that's certainly part of the script. I mean, to be able to think. Um, 
and again, it comes back down to reframing a lot. So like, if you know, again, to make it trivial, you, you, you're driving in traffic and, you know, someone cuts you off, right? The natural state, sort of the, the road rage state is to just to be irate, you know, and uh, to essentially hate that person, right. you know, the, the person whose face you can't even see. I mean, you can't even tell whether the person's 90 years old or 20 years old, right? right? And that should matter to you, right? Like if, if, if you should have a different feeling about a 90 year old than a 20 year old in that moment, given um, the implications. Um, but so, uh, you know, like the, a stoical kind of reframing of that would be you, you to, is to recognize you don't know what is going on in this person's life, mm-hmm. right? And and nine times out of ten, if you could know it, you would feel compassion for right. what's going on there, you know, and you'd feel gratitude that you're not suffering the same problem. I mean, the, yeah. the one reframing I use all the time now is that whenever something bad is happening, or something, you know, quote bad, something that, that is causing me stress is happening, um, I think of all of the worst things that are not happening, and I just think of how much I would pay, you know, literally pay, to get back to the situation, precisely the circumstance I'm now in, that I'm now stressing. About, if you right? have worse conditions, about. yeah, yeah, right. So, like, just so, you yeah, had no like, legs, if you, you were exactly, sick, you, if like, you, you, yeah. you, you, you find out, you, you know, you know, I did not find out today that I have a brain tumor, right? So, whatever I was stressing about today, if I had, if I got the call that I, you know, I have a brain tumor, right? How much would I pay to get back into precisely the situation <laughs> where I was just stressing about, you know, whatever right. it was on my schedule or, you know, yeah. you know, some hassle? Um, it's just. Uh, it's a non. Everything is a non-issue until it's a real issue, and then so you, you, when you take something that's a real issue, like a brain tumor, then you have. I mean, then the, then the question is, how much of the day are you going to spend having a brain tumor, right? I mean, being busy having a brain suffering tumor, suffering about the brain exactly, tumor, yeah. and suffering about your uncertainty about the future, right? So the, the, there's a time course to all of this. So mm-hmm. you know, like at each point. I mean, this is where you know worry is almost always pointless because, like, in each moment, there's either something you can do to solve a problem, or there isn't. Right mm-hmm. now, if there is something to do, well, then just do that thing, right? Do, solve the problem, right? If there isn't, there's actually nothing to worry about. Like, like the worry adds nothing to that situation, right? So you're, so you know, if you have a brain tumor. Yes, you need to go from one doctor to and probably to a second doctor for a second opinion, and you, you find the surgeon you you want. And there's a whole process. You're going to get an MRI. You know all of it. You're 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 having to deal with a lot of yes, objectively stressful things. But I mean, big picture, we're all in this situation. I mean, life itself is a brain tumor. I mean, we're, we're all going to die. We're all we're all we're, we're all going to go on this. We're going to get the full tour now. I mean, for some of us, it, you know, some of us will be very lucky, and it will be very orderly and free of pain, and we'll be surrounded by everyone we love. Hundred years old. Yeah, yeah, it's just going to go perfectly. And for some people, it'll be chaotic and terrifying and short or long. I mean, so it, it, like it's every permutation, and I'm not uh, denying that it's rational to have preferences there, right? I mean, like, you know, you, you do want the orderly, loving, right. uh, you know, uh, you know uh, and not untimely unraveling of it all, um, uh, rather than the opposite. But it's whatever is happening, you have this moment, and then you're thinking. And, I mean, and, and, you're, and you're thinking about the future, and you're thinking about the, fa- the past is the mechanism by which you will truly suffer mm. at each moment. Because it is, in fact, true to say that even physical pain is something around which you can develop an impressive ability to be equanimous, right? And we, and we also have, you know, we have, you know, for extreme pain, we have painkillers. I mean, like, happily, we're, living, we're not living in, in you know, 1700, mm-hmm. where, you know, someone is just kind of sawing off your limb, Suffering. you know. You know uh, <laughs> Um, after the leeches didn't work, uh, <laughs> so um, you know, ninety-nine percent of our suffering around everything, you know, even objectively horrible things like brain tumors, is our thought about past and future, is the regret, and it, I mean, it's 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 the story we're telling ourselves.